Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. This is episode 225. My name is Rhea Windcaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week, we have four cider makers talking about terroir. There'll be more on that, but first, a wee bit of news out and about in Ciderville. If you're a regular listener to Cider Chat, you know that a couple episodes ago, I announced that I'm adding a new segment called Stories in Ciderville which is an opportunity for writers to have an essay of 3,000 words or less that then would be read on the podcast by the author. So just to put it into perspective, 3,000 words or less, it kind of spans out to about three minutes of audio, which sounds like a short amount of time, but it really uh, is, I think in many ways, the perfect amount. And just this past week, had an audio recording sent my way that will be featured on episode 226. So this author was able to just probably use the smartphone app where you could kind of record any kind of audio. And that also allows you to kind of practice reading your essay and then send the completed audio recording my way. So I'm stoked beyond words that we're moving forward with this because the essay actually, it was really touching for me. I I loved it. And it's kind of a a new piece where I feel like we are missing that storytelling component, which we often will do over a glass and a whole lot of laughter and sometimes even tears sharing our our, uh, trials and tribulations not necessarily geeking out on the technical aspect of cider making, but just telling a story, the backbone of cider. So that's what we're looking forward to. If you are an author, a writer, a wannabe writer who's never been published before, you know someone who is looking for a good writing project, please share this, pass it along. There's a lot of people right now during this worldwide pandemic who might be feeling a little stuck I have always found it's a good remedy to begin with a blank page and begin writing. So send those stories my way to Rhea at ciderchat.com. Now I know not everyone is a writer with an essay to share which is why I'm going to offer an additional segment bringing out the news from Ciderville direct from you versus me kind of putting my own twist on it. And that means I'm offering to commercial makers and non-commercial makers alike to send me an audio clip of news from your spot of Ciderville. So for let's start with commercial makers. If you have a tasting room, you want to share your tasting room hours, you want to talk about a little cider that you have, That's what I'm looking for. Or you could just tell me how the the trees are blossoming in your neighborhood. That's fine too. And if you're a non-commercial maker and you just want to share some news about a cider that you just drunk uh, or you are making a batch of cider, it's all good. I'm looking for good news out and about in Ciderville. And, you know, how how are you surviving this uh, this worldwide pandemic. It just is, it's rough. It's no doubt about it. It is rough. And I'd like to hear that from you. So send me your audio clips and I'll put that out on the podcast too, from you and your perfect spot of Ciderville to the listeners of Cider Chat. Just send that to Rhea at CiderChat.com. Walking through the orchards, dancing in the street. Smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. And now it is time for our featured presentation featuring a pre-recorded 
workshop presentation from CiderCon 2020 in Oakland, California. And this workshop was titled Terroir Spotlight, Western Massachusetts. You're going to be hearing myself, because I was asked to be the moderator for this panel, along with the four following cider makers. We have Steve Garwood of Ragged Hill Cider, Soham Bott of the Artifact Cider Project, Steve Gojin of Bear Swamp Cider and Distillery, and Field Maloney of West County Cider. Now, the span of time that these makers kind of go from like beginning of the cider making history in the U.S. began in 1984 with West County Cider. And that's one of the reasons why Western Massachusetts was selected as the first ever terroir spotlight to be presented at CiderCon. And I know that there's going to be many more in the years to come. And this is something, truthfully, that I've been hoping to have conversations about for a very long time. Because regionally, for me, I do experience different (laughs) taste components dependent upon the region of the world that I'm in. And certainly here in the U.S. too, whether it's from New England to the Pacific Northwest to the Midwest and everywhere in between. They have their own specific soil, climate, culture, tradition right there. And that's a little bit of what we'll be talking about in this workshop. Specifically, though, we're going to be really zoning in on tradition because that's a big driver of the terroir that you will experience in a New England-based cider. And before we get there, I'd like to say that not only can you listen to this full talk right now on the podcast that you downloaded, but you also have an opportunity to watch the presentation at the Cider Chat YouTube channel. So there's a double header today, both the podcast and then just this featured piece is on the Cider Chat YouTube channel, synced up with the PowerPoint and additional slides that I found to kind of add in and thicken the soup, if you will. And if you could, while you're there, Subscribe to the Cider Chat YouTube channel, which helps me increase my visibility with the content that I'm providing and kind of up the end game as I bring in more and more video. So again, a double header here with the podcast and at the Cider Chat YouTube channel. Now let's all grab a glass and join this chat. Okay, well, we're going to get started. Welcome to the Western Mass Terroir Spotlight. And um, before we do anything else, can everybody grab your number one cider right there, which is the Roxbury Russet 2017, and just kind of hold your hand up? Okay. Well, cheers to all of you and to CiderCon and to Cider, both here and around the world. Cheers, everybody. Yeah. (laughs) All righty. Uh, we're, we have five ciders to be tasting. So if you signed up for this and you thought there's four ciders, we actually have a fifth one from Massachusetts, too. Um, so I'm going to just kind of keep on rolling through here and do a little bit of introductions. You can see that if you've been out to Franklin County Cider Days, you might recognize that barn there that is uh, on Peckville Road, uh, quintessential New England red barn. Our presenters today and cider makers, we have Steve Garwood from Ragged Hill. They were uh, beginning commercial cider making in 2017. Soham Bot uh, from Artifact in 2014. Steve Gujan. Gujan, yeah. Gujan, I got it. Okay. From Bear Swamp, actually, it's a longer name Bear Swamp Orchard, Distillery, and Cidery. And they started commercial production in 2011 and Field Maloney of West County Cider, and you'll notice that date there, 1984. And, uh, right. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that shortly. My name is Rhea Wincaller. I am the producer and Cider MC at Cider Chat Podcast. Uh, anybody out there know Cider Chat? All right, Woo-hoo, right on. And also Totally Cider Tours. The next tour coming up is to the UK. So keep that posted. All right, where are we located? Well, in New England. And we have two locations up there. You can see the one uh, big giant red dot, that's like Franklin County. Uh, We're considered Western Massachusetts. And Steve, who's from Ragged Hill, right here, 
is in West Brookfield, and that's on the other side of the Quabbin Reservoir. So that big little like blue area is the Quabbin Reservoir. That area was um, made into a reservoir over the course of World War II when nobody was paying attention. They hired all these folks from Boston which the locals called woodpeckers, to cut down the entire area and um, flooded five towns, uh, which were just filled with all these distilleries and cider scene there. So it's uh, quite, a, quite a scene. So that's where we are located. And today we are talking about terroir of our area. And this is the four elements of terroir, is climate, soil, terrain, and tradition. And tradition is a, a big part of what we're gonna be talking about for what we do in our area in cider making, certainly these producers. Just to start with the, the climate piece, this is the average snowfall, 64 inches, and uh, rainfall, 38 inches. Uh, so just so for centimeters, for those of you out there, that's 162 centimeters of snowfall and 97 centimeters for rainfall. Just to give you an idea there, and it's, it's, there's snow on the ground right now. How many makers out there have snow on the ground right now where you're based in? Okay. There's no snow around here, though. <laughs> All right, we're going to just look a little bit at prime farmland of this area. You can see that little blue dot there. That is one of the areas where there's a lot of orchards that these producers are pulling from. And so the dark green area is considered prime farmland soil. And that's where their orchards are. So these are just, you know, state maps that you could get from, from Massachusetts. Bear Swamp Orchard, where Steve is based. Again, that is his uh, homestead site there. And that is a farmland of unique importance and prime farmland, too. We look here, we have Ragged Hill. And that's a little photo that Steve sent over of the glacial till decomposed granite and sand. So just to give you a little sense, we're not going to talk a lot about terrain and soils as for a much longer conversation. We're just going to do a general overview. And I think what's very important is just for our purposes to talk really about tradition. And you have two, two photos up there, Terry and Judith Maloney, that's Field's parents. And there's Terry and Field in the cellar at West County Cider. So that cidery was started at their, their site up in Coleraine, Massachusetts, and all the cider making was done right there. And that almost brings tears to my eyes when I look at that. <laughs> There's a lot to be said there, you know. These are the first people in our country to start a commercial cidery in 1984. There was nobody there. So Terry and Judith and field he was a young man had to like stomp the ground like nobody's business nobody wanted to hear it nobody wanted to bring it into their sites and then slowly a couple of years later you started seeing like Farnham Hill and some other producers but at that time in the U.S. there was not one single cidery commercial cidery so I like to consider Franklin County in our region. Of course, Massachusetts is the first place in the U.S. where cider making, you know, they start bringing in and planting the first orchard in the U.S. when it was colonized. And of course, when the Maloney's started cider making in 1984, that was really like the, the cork that was heard around the world. It really popped it and got it going. And now looking how many years later from that time where we are today, it's just... Amazing, absolutely amazing. So we're going to um, move on to our first uh, producer here, who is oh, all the way over here to my left. This is Soham. He is um, the cider is based in Florence, Massachusetts, right now. Uh, Artifact Cider Project, and a little bit about Soham. He co-founded Artifact in 2014 with a desire to make exceptional cider a more widely celebrated characteristic of the Northeast. I just love that, that bio there. Artifact makes forward-looking cider that respects tradition, but refuses to be limited by it. Which is, you know, <laughs> well, what's that about? <laughs> so anyways, um, so I'm, I'm gonna just kind of pass this over to you, and uh, let's just talk about this first cider here, which is 
a perfect selection, a Roxbury russet, which is so well known for our area and a really traditional cider making apple. Yeah, sure. Um, so just to walk you through the cider that you guys have, um, this is a 2017 Roxbury russet from two orchards. Um, they're actually not in Massachusetts. <laughs> they're uh, just 20 miles north. Um, one is uh, uh, in the Connecticut River Valley. So we kind of focus on this middle Connecticut River Valley region, which starts uh, in Coleraine, Massachusetts, and then kind of continues north a little bit uh, into southern Vermont and southern New Hampshire. Um, it's two different orchards, Roxbury Russet, um, fermented naturally, spontaneously, aged in poly uh, for about nine months, um, put into a bottle. Uh, there really isn't, we didn't really do anything to this. Um, you know, it was uh, a wild ferment. And the idea there is just that, you know, as a Massachusetts cider maker, um, you know, I kind of have a fetish for Roxbury Russet. Um, it's the oldest named American variety, apparently. Um, you know, around 1630 in Roxbury, which is outside of Boston, um, in the backyard of Joseph Warren. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's kind of uh, a cornerstone uh, apple for us to at least explore uh, when we start talking about um, terroir. Um, when we when we were, were going through the list of the four things, um, and and you land on tradition. Uh, and then, you know, in, in our bio, we say that we're looking forward um, and kind of bucking tradition sometimes. You know, I think that I can't overstate the importance of West County cider to the artifact philosophy um, of cider making. And, you know, I think that in the beginning, um, their generosity and mentorship helped me establish um, what my own philosophy would be. And they kind of, they set up a roadmap, uh, you know, that only somebody that's been around for so long that has that kind of wisdom can do. Um, and for me, that roadmap was around, it was a little bit, it was kind of a varietal thing. Macintosh, Baldwin, Redfield, and Pippin. And you think about that as, as something that was worked on over years, uh, so thoughtfully kind of a curation of these four apples that represents so much about our place and the future. You know, like, this is something that was innovative, you know, that would be innovative today to do, but it was innovative, you know, it was innovation that they were doing 20 years before most of us were even in business. They were doing it before I was even born. Um, you know, and so, um, you know, I think that it's hard for me to not talk about that because those apples, in a sense, represent a lot of what we could do um, in terms of local varietals, which have certain qualities. It's not about the international cider world, it's about our own American cider identity. Um, and so, you know, in the beginning I had a whole notebook full of flavored ciders. You know, after, after a couple, you know, after the first year of making cider and, and having, you know, Field and, and Judith uh, help me figure out what I was doing, I, I threw that book out and, and decided to really focus, you know, on this kind of work. Um, and so, it's a question of trying to take these ideas, this framework, this roadmap, and as a foundation, but then trying to take it to, the, you know, seeing what, where else we can go, what the potential of that could be. Mm -hmm. So something like this Roxbury Russet, we're trying to showcase the fruit um, and what it is, but also with the other componentry, microbiology, location, um, aging, et cetera, to try and bring those qualities out in the most pure way. For a modern cidery, because that's really what I consider artifact to be a modern cidery in that way, I think it's a great representation of New England cider. And um, so thank you for that. But we're going to keep on moving on because we have a lot of ciders to drink today, and that's always a good thing. We're going to uh, move on to Bear Swamp Distillery, Cidery, and Orchard. Not necessarily in that orchard, but all, it's all good, just the same. <laughs> this is Steve, and uh, he's based in Asheville. He and his wife, Jennifer Williams, started this uh, homestead. They bought the property from Steve's parents because they saw an apple orchard there, and they just saw it as, oh, that's a good, that's good free booze there, so let's start making cider. And um, they started producing, uh, well, a pick-your-own organic orchard in 2006, and then 2011 uh, became a commercial cider-making scene. They do wild ferment, unfiltered, and unsulfided. 
In 2017, most recently, they started distilling there. So that's a, a bit of the trajectory. And they have six acres and 75 cultivars. And so uh, let's, uh, let's all gra grab that glass. If you haven't been trying it, and just uh, take a little sip. So yeah, a little background on this. Um, I grew up in an area, uh, there was a lot of orchards. Real steep area, north facing kind of slope, looking up towards Vermont. Um, high elevation for our area, 1,600 feet. The tradition in this, my first good hangovers when I was a teenager and such were from New England style ciders. What traditionally do, uh, was done in New England is farmers used to like to kind of soup up their cider a little bit, bump up that alcohol level, you can probably taste that. Um, what they would do is add other fermentable sugars. In the case of the most of the people around us, they were adding brown sugar, raisins, and then aging that in whiskey barrels. So, and that's exactly what this is. Whiskey and rum barrels, uh, brown sugar, raisins. We age it for a little over, this is about two and a half years old. Um, and yeah, so we usually will start like a, uh, a primary fermentation with, with everything in, in, a, in a large stainless tank move it all to barrels where it sits for like a year and a half and then blend all those barrels back into a large, like, you know, 2,000 liter tank and, and bottle it from there. But um, this was, I mean, I, I think that this is an interesting one for me. I mean, it's kind of bold, it's over the top, it's very d different, obviously, from the Roxbury Russet. It, it's your, you know, New England winter warmer, but it was also the only cider style that survived prohibition. Really, this was what cider culture was until you know, in, in this country for the most part until things started to kind of come into play again in, in the 80s with uh, the Maloney's. So um, it's a real, I mean, this is all the farmer, if you hear about people making cider in, in New England and even into the Midwest, where I know there's a lot of these same traditions, they're adding some kind of sugar, some kind of dried fruit to it to bump that up, so. And what should be known, like in that area and probably in a lot of parts of the U.S. too, there was always wooden barrels out in the barn. Uh, certainly, you know, I have stories from my grandparents, you know, every Saturday they would go there and the horse would just bring them home uh, after a bit of uh, drinking, you know, in the barn and the barrel. So it's very customary to have barrels. And actually, I see John Bunker there, and I remember the story John Bunker talking about, you know, back in the day, barrels were so easy to get. I mean, he'd, he'd be making uh, barrels of cider and selling the cider and the barrel for like 10 bucks or something. It was just, you know, you can't even fathom it. So there were barrels everywhere, and for our particular area, there was one particular cider maker by the name of Dewey, yes. who everybody knew. Dewey's dynamite. And <laughs> I, I still Especially talk, everyone under 21. Yes. Well, that's not necessarily true, because I've talked to many people who are now much uh, uh, full-on full adults, and they, even they could go and get something from Dewey's, and it was always... It wasn't totally cider kin. It was a, had a little bit of a, a spritz to it. And he was well-known making cider all the time. And when I first met the Maloney's uh, back in the day, and before Cider Days was really you know, where it is today, it was just a one-day event, it was just all the makers coming together with all their barrel-aged cider, much like what Steve has right here. And a lot of times it would be a little bit fortified, too. Yeah, this is about 12 and a half percent, so you know, a little out of your normal cider range. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's your New England winter warmer. It's like two feet of snow in the orchard right now when I left. So I always kind of wonder about that, though, uh, the fact that I, I always think of colonists, and I kind of kind of hang with this like New England style cider because I feel it's such a hot commodity to have raisins and any kind of added things that why would they put that into their cider when they it might be so difficult to get something like that. So I wonder if it's actually raisins or more berries or something that they would gather from. Well, I mean, the they could grow. I mean, grapes. We have lots. We have lots of grapes. It's true that, that we, grow, grapes. we grow grapes. That's but true. Any, any other dried fruit would work. Mm -hmm. So anything you grow. Just to kind of keep it full up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just it keeps the fermentation going. So, um, the the, second, yeah. Second. The idea with that is it. You put raisins in there and it would basically all, it would keep a little blanket of CO2 on top because that constant little bit of fermentation that's taking place from the sugar slowly being released from the raisins or other dried fruit. So it was actually uh, uh, kind of act as a, a preservative uh, pr process too, so. Can I ask how many um, makers out here are working with barrels? Okay. So there is a pretty big learning trajectory with that and um, 
you know, certainly you're throwing in some of that fruit there, and it kind of keeps it kind of percolating along there, but it needs a little bit of nutrients there. Instead of, like, throwing in a kind of chemical nutrient, you just throw in some fruit and kick it up. All right, we're going to be going with our, our third cider here, which is from Ragged Hill Cider Company. This is Steve Garwood to my, my left again. He's actually here with his daughter, Anne, who's part of a big part of uh, Ragged Hill Cider. And Steve's a cider maker. When he was a young man, you know, his, I, the story goes that he was with his uh, friend, and after a long day of hang, you know, a hot, humid day, because in New England we have humidity like nobody's business, they'd go down at the, into the father's damp root cellar, probably maybe a... a uh, soiled, you know, like a hard packed floor, cool place, and have some cider. Uh, he then, uh, many years later, started uh, becoming, you know, practicing with home brewing, and then had some French cider. I thought that was pretty interesting, Steve. A little bit of French cider, which kind of wet your whistle and reminded you of the, those old days, and here you are so many years later. Uh, they started producing your, your year that you went into production, uh, 2017. So pretty recent, and they've already hit the ground running with a number of awards, and so we thought this would be a really great example of yet another, not necessarily what we consider Western Mass, it's more Central Mass. Central well, Mass is a... We're west of Western. West of Worcester. West of Worcester, we'd say. West of Worcester. That's Western Mass. That's Western Mass, yeah. It's all, it's all good. But it's a little bit different because it's on the other side of uh, the Quab, and so the soil's a little bit different. These producers, the other three, are all within like the Connecticut River Valley, which is just amazing farmland. And not to say that West Brookfield isn't like that, but it is different soil. So it kind of you know, adds different characters to it. But the tradition still remains the same. How about if we hear a little bit about your traditional dry? First, I, I just wanted to say a little bit more about our region. You know, everybody who, who grows an apple tree thinks they have the best apples in the world, and, and we're no different. So, it's because we do. <laughs> but um, it is interesting to think about our apple growing region for everybody here. Uh, you can draw a straight line from Buffalo to Boston. It goes through New York, goes through Massachusetts. This is the prime apple growing region in the Northeast, we believe. Now, John Bunker and Steve Wood, they, they have this uh, northern apple thing, and that, that's another region. But um, uh, the, our climate is very similar. Our, cl our climate is, is really the same for everybody up here. We're closer to Albany. Our climate is like Albany, not like Boston. I listen to Albany radio, uh, you know, for my weather reports, WAMC. Oh, yeah. yeah. The best. <laughs> best public radio around. And uh, so... Uh, we have, we have the same climate, but our soils are very different. And uh, in the, the New York apple growing region is very limestone soil. Uh, uh, got a higher, higher pH. And um, for us, we have a soil that's uh, very, uh, it's granite, basically. It's uh, granite and metamorphic rock that's been uh, decomposed. Where there isn't granite, there's sand and then just a little teeny layer of topsoil. So it's not, it's not fertile soil, uh, generally speaking. Uh, and, uh, but the apples love it. It's very, very well-drained soil. Uh, we, our, our climate is, is pretty wet, it's pretty damp, as Rhea mentioned. Uh, sometimes we have too much water, like when the apples are blooming. But um, uh, that gives our apples uh, uh, in Massachusetts a distinctive terroir, uh, distinctive taste. Uh, it, they have a, a minerality when you, uh, when, you, when you ferment them. And uh, it's certainly something that we're working, wor working towards to try to bring out the characteristics of our apples. Mm -hmm. Our orchard uh, was, was first planted in 1985. And... Uh, is, is planted uh, at that time. Everybody planted what you think of as uh, dessert apples or culinary apples. So this particular cider is made from our older trees that are culinary apples, but certainly have uh, what are also some uh, traditional Massachusetts cider apples like uh, Baldwin's, 
um, Cortlands. Um, we have a Empires, which I think make, make a very good cider. Um, so this has a little bit of residual sugar in it. Mm -hmm. We halt the fermentation on this, and which is a fairly inexact uh, process. Anybody who's ever tried to do it, you're not sure exactly where it's going to end up. Uh, we put it in a, in a tank and chill it down to uh, 30 degrees and try to stop it. Uh, then I may adjust it with a little bit of uh, a little bit of iced juice. So we make an ice cider too. So. I, I may adjust the, the sweetness with a little bit of, of ice juice. So that gives it a, a little bit of intensity also. It's, uh, it's force carbonated. Um, we like the, like the carbonation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hope you enjoy Thank it. You. Yeah. Yes. How is it stabilized? How is it stabilized? So uh, just stabilized by racking and chilling. I use a, a, a conical tank when I chill it down, try to get all the yeast out of the, uh, out of the bottom. And uh, then, I mean, what, what really kind of saves us for now is that it's all sold and consumed very quickly. <laughs> well said, right, well said, no doubt. So we're going to, uh, if you haven't gotten the, the fourth one, pour two, please raise your hand so you can get that fourth one. And that's going to be from West County. But before we move on there, I think one of the um, unique pieces in the U.S. in particular is our terroir is going to get zoned in more and more. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of orchard are supplying out, out of state or shipping. You know, Farnham Hill will ship their, their product all the way up to Michigan or further beyond. Um, as Soham mentioned, he's pulling in um, juice or apples. Is it juice or apples that you're pulling in from? Uh, do you, do you get, get the juice directly when you're pulling in, in for like the Roxbury Russet? Or is it? Um, um, we buy the apples, they all go to Pine Hill. Pine Hill presses them. Okay. So that has a certain terroir, like the, you know, Pine Hill, if you've been to Franklin County Cider Days, and that was up on the map, very close to that barn that first, we first started that display. They press a lot of apples, supply a lot of, uh, like, home cider makers like myself. And that will have a certain kind of, like, you know, in-house yeast, a certain kind of element to it, and a, and a certain way that they're doing it over time and over time. And they were, really have been a big part of Franklin County Cider Days since the beginning and what they're doing there and continue to provide bulk cider blends for hobbyist cider makers who come to that region every November. But I think for myself traveling around, and I'm sure the, the rest of these guys up here would agree, and all of you too, when you taste something from a different region, you're tasting that terroir. And terroir is something that we haven't really talked about in the cider community too much. From my perspective, and I do have a perspective, uh, that perspective for me is, is, it's like the brand, it's that lifeblood, and that's really what the tradition is about. And I think that's where, for the U.S. cider makers, that's where our strongest point is. And in time, we're gonna dial it in, depending upon the orchards and orchard-based selections as we get deeper into the soils. But it takes a little bit of while to get there first, which leads us to tradition. Does everyone have that? Um, the next one here, the West County? Yeah. All right, great. So let's move on to West County. I'd like to talk a little bit about Field Maloney here. <laughs> um, on my podcast, one of the first episodes I, I uh, did, episode one, was with Field. I uh, pulled up on a, a classic day. He was kind of coming out the door. He said, oh, Rhea, I forgot you're coming. And, uh, but somehow we, we, we uh, got it together. It was in the fall. And I've known Field for a long time. You probably didn't know me because... Uh, I remember him kind of coming in and out when his parents would host these dinners for Franklin County Cider Days, which was always a very special ticket to get to up at that little home site there. He, he and his family, it's kind of interesting that we're actually here in Oakland because 
they moved from California to Massachusetts. And, um, and, then, and that's where they really started their cider making. So they landed in Coleraine, Massachusetts. Uh, Field's father was a doctor uh, at, um, in the emergency room at our local hospital. And his mom is and continues to be one of the best like, spokeswomen around for, for cider. She is a, a queen of Pomona, as far as we're concerned, and of all of the US. And so he has this uh, really amazing kind of background here. And I'm sure you have some uh, different stories, too, of the tradition of cider making, because he's seen it from such a vantage that none of us can ever like really take in. So it's a certain, certainly a pleasure that we have that kind of heritage. You saw him in that cellar with his father there working on it. I, I know that Field was working in like New York City early on as a writer. Uh, he's a very, very capable writer and has always been doing cider making because that's what you do with your folks. And then kind of got thrust into cider making unexpectedly when we lost, or certainly he lost his father in 2010. And that was an industrial accident in a cidery. Um, so it was, it was kind of a blow to, to everyone and certainly to his family. Um, but he came in and has helped uh, keep West County Cider going. And it's a darn good thing that he was in there with his father and no cider, no cider apples, and has really created a brand that is so sought out, because, and, and rightly so, because it has such a tradition in the US. It, will, it is historical beyond, beyond words. So um, Field Maloney, and he's brought two ciders for us to taste here. And Field, can you talk a little bit about the first cider there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the first cider is, is the Pura Vida, which um, is from, uh, let's see, 75 and 100-year-old trees. and. Uh, it's Macintosh in Cortland, and um, uh, I love its density. I feel like it has, I mean, I, I, I've always sort of been Catholic, not, not, not in terms of the religious usage of it, although I, but, but, but in terms of a, a non-doctrinaire and my beliefs about, like, I still believe it might be possible to make a great red delicious cider if you got, like, incredible red delicious apples. So, so even though like we were the first in the modern movement to grow, you know, cider apples for cider, um, like for commercially, um, I, I've also felt like there was untapped potential. And so I was never one who was like, there's true cider apples and not. And so like this to me demonstrates what like really good Macintosh and Cortland apples can do and the sort of bouquet and the density and the sort of structure through it. Um, so I'll say that, but then can I? Please. So, so first I'm gonna ask, tell Rhea, thanks for all the, it makes my ears burn a little bit. <laughs> and then um, I'm gonna ask you guys, if, if I seem a little flustered, um, I have a hole in my pocket, not, not, not um, literally, but figuratively. Or not figuratively, but literally. literally. And I didn't realize I did, so my wallet fell out about <laughs> half an hour, but it's within the hotel somewhere, so I'm sure it's going to be found. But I'd like you all to take two seconds or a second and just, just sort of uh, do a like, little psychic wish for my wallet <laughs> to be returned. And, and then I just want to address this whole culture thing. And, and I actually think that, that we're all sort of stewards, and, and, and it's sort of like... Um, and, and, and the funny thing is, like, we might have set off a cork in the modern cider movement. Again, like, we, we did start in 1984. My parents had come, and the, the California part of the picture is they were m making um, wine um, in Napa. They had a friend uh, who, who had an, uh, a vineyard in Carneros, and this is in the late 60s when Napa was sort of like where cider was 10 years ago, okay? It was still, and I think, and my father being a doctor, which is sort of partly scientific, was very interested in the biochemistry and the, um, 
and the um, you know you know microbiological aspects of fermentation I think were delightful to him and studying fermentation through a microscope and so and I think he also kind of had some sort of homesteader wanting to figure out a way to buy buy some land in the country figure out a way to make that land sustainable so um, and our land was like a lot of this New England land is pretty hard scrabble and, and especially in western Massachusetts and especially the apple land because the the flat land tended to go towards higher income crops like um, uh, uh, tobacco or corn or whatever. And it was the hillsides where partly because, you know, it, it was harder to drive a tractor on, and then also part of the effect of hillsides is you have um, frost drainage, and you have, I mean, you know, hillside winemaking is also revered. And, and so when my parents got out here, they were, um, they had made wine, but you couldn't really grow grapes. I think now that's starting to change and the people are figuring out a way, it's less impossible to grow grapes and make wine in, 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 on the East Coast now, but it's still, but it was also like they stumbled into a cornucopia of apple growing and um, cider making. And yeah, in some way we were the first to do it um, commercially, but there were still like, as, as Steve would say, it was like there were, it was like, it was this vanishing thing. It had been slowly been, been vanishing since prohibition, but there were still a lot of farmers in Hill Folk who would put aside a barrel of cider and people who had these old trees, like there were, and they were often great old trees, like Baldwin's, like Soham's talking about, that were in their backyard. And it was like, and especially like in the really rural hard up days of like the depression, you know, and before it was easy to get Budweiser, you know, you'd set, set up store with some cider from the, 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 uh, the two, two old Baldwin trees that you had in back. And people had their lore about um, different trees. And um, so it, was, it wasn't sort of, it wasn't like we popped the cork. It was more like we got here. And my, my, I think that my mother and father had the, the prescience to see that this was something like you could make incredible wine, and they've been in a place where the same thing was going on, where you could make, where where people were discovering the potential of, like like California in the, in the 60s, like people had kind of given up on serious winemaking. It was it was, and and I think that when they got to Western Massachusetts, like there's all these apples and the possibilities of fermentation. So they popped the cork, but it would be, it would be dis disingenuous or. Uh, untrue to the historic, it wasn't like they popped the cork and there was a party and everyone threw money at them. It was more like they popped the cork and then like 10 years later they were like, hard cider is such a wonderful idea, why doesn't anyone like drink cider? And I remember after, in the first year, right after college, I spent a year trying to get sales going in Boston because that was sort of the big market for... And it, to a certain extent, the wine market was, especially if you're making a premium hard cider, because you couldn't sell it. At, and so when I, when I was going around, so I was going around in the Boston wine liquor store world, it's a pretty rough world, and, uh, and I was going around, and I would do lots of tastings, and it was sort of like, you know, you'd say, I've got cider here, and people would say, um, what cider? Like, like, like there was, wasn't even, we had to call it apple, like, it, when it was a news story, it was often referred to as apple wine because there wasn't even really a category of hard cider. Like, so we sort of thought of ourselves as a niche drink without a niche. And then, but I think that there was such belief that these apples are so good. For, and like my father would be stirred by, like George Washington wrote in his journal during, during the Revolutionary Campaign when it went through Massachusetts that the Massachusetts cider was the best he had tasted. And this was a Virginia planter. So that was like all those little things would sort of sort of keep the faith going, and you keep be beating on the door saying, "Cider, cider, cider's gonna come around." And then by like the mid '90s, it started seeming like people actually, and then like in 2000, it seemed like, "Oh, people are really getting into cider." And then you know now, like the the kid has grown up and, and left the house, but it wasn't like it wasn't like it was our idea. It was just like we were part of this thing that had existed before us that had become neglected. And we were like, wow, this is cool. Let's see what we can do with this. And so I guess that is, is yeah.
That's it. Awesome. So, yeah. well said. Well yeah. said. Yeah. Early on, being a resident of Massachusetts back then, um, you know, we. I didn't know about cider commercially. We just had it kind of being made, as as Field was saying, and then. You know, it's kind of like a knock on the door. Do you want to, like, teach cider making for Franklin County Cider Days, which is like 26 years ago? And back then, that first year that I taught cider making, I would say, you want to learn, to, you want to learn how to make cider? You want to learn how to make cider? All the people kind of come by to pick up the sweet cider. No, no, no. Finally, at the end of the day, some, a couple came in, and I said, you want to learn how to make cider? They say, no. And I say, tough. And I went, I closed the door, and I locked it. And I said, you're not leaving until you learn how to make cider. And each year, it would just kind of keep growing just a little bit and a little bit, but it took a while. And at that point, the makers, there were just so few around. You know, you could count them on your hand. And most of those were the people that you're talking about, you know, that Field was saying, was just the farmers with big old barrels sitting around and pulling it out and, and having a lot of fun, no doubt. And then it slowly grew. And so, you know, to actually be up here right now with all these makers just blows me through the water. Because, it's, you know, we've come a long way, for sure. Yeah, the first yeah. cider I ever tasted was uh, made by a farmer who would be shocked to call himself a cider maker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was a dairy farmer. He didn't care about cider. He had some apple trees, and he got it, got it pressed by... Uh, a uh, local guy who had a cider press, put it in a barrel in the basement, and uh, us teenagers drank it uh, after haying, as you said, Rhea. Yeah. Uh, but yet, that, that's, what I, that's what I remember. I remember that, that refreshing uh, blast of, of cool uh, uh, cider that was, uh, it, it, it had a, a fizz to it. Uh, probably tasted like vinegar more than anything else, but I sure loved it back then. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, you know, for you guys up here, in terms of all the cider presses that we see in the barns in our region, they're, they're just pretty much everywhere. Uh, I know recently I purchased an, uh, a cider press at an auction in Buckland that had been up in the hill towns for years, and it's from the 1880s, and it was just kind of moving from one family to the other. It's just big, beastie type of, you know, cider presses everywhere. And just about every barn, every New England barn had a cider press kicking around. You know, I think the, the, the point with that, yeah, is that this is how uh, people kind of lose track of that now with refrigeration and everything else, thinking about the traditions of it. This is how you preserved apples, vinegar, cider, and, and through spirits too. Um, and I know as a, as a distiller also, we're just talking. I, He's I, making incredible, the most Calvados-like American apple brandy I've ever tasted. Just to... <laughs> It's coming along. But, um, but yeah, but just the whole idea of having these uh, cider presses that were everywhere. I mean, every, all the farming, it was self-provisioning farms. Everyone was making it. Um, I look back at like tax records from the town I live in. Um, going back into the late 1800s, and there were, you know, the, in just my little corner of town of 1,800 people, there were three stills on the tax records, and those were just the ones that were on the tax records in like, the, in like 1870. You know, so it was just part, and I live in this corner, you saw the map, but the corner, I live at the corner of Holly Road and Apple Valley Road, so they've been growing apples there for a long time. It was just all these, you know, it's this like tradition that goes back a long time in these areas as far as how you preserve the fruit. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, do these ciders take different than what you might have in your region if you're not based in New England? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. You notice it a little bit different? Yeah. I mean, I know for myself, kind of traveling around both in the U.S. and around the world, you get a hankering for your hometown. Yeah, you know, and you want to kind of like have that taste. Or if I go to Michigan, no, it's really, really different. And I know I've been beating the drum for a while that we, it, it's good that we start talking about terroir because there is terroir throughout the U.S. and, of course, regionally around the world, too. I mean, you go to the U.K., and there's nothing like a U.K. cider. You know, that is like, bam, right there. And as we kind of start stretching this out and going to the consumers, I think it helps them, too, to realize 
that there are different regions and different characteristics that are based upon the climate and the soil and the culture and the terrain. Yeah, I've been tasting a lot of Gravenstein ciders out here. And I think there's a pretty big contrast between, between these and the, and the Gravenstein ciders we're tasting from Sonoma County. Yeah, I think Gravenstein, when I first heard that, I mean, for me, it's like as a New England grower, when I first heard that people were making like cider out of Gravensteins, I thought, what the hell? Or, you know, it's like, I thought it was a joke because, I mean, the Gravensteins that people, the few that you actually see grown in, in New England are junk. So it's just, you know, it's kind of part of the terroir. So it's just it's super interesting what you can do mm-hmm. the different fruit from different regions and how it grows. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, something that we actually talk and think a lot about when we look at all the ciders that we make, even, you know, that are the larger, uh, more commercial um, batch size, kind of not just small batch ciders, um, we really try to think what are characteristics um, that are unique to the Northeast. Um, it's, we're not trying to like, we're not trying to make knockoff ciders. So what are the things that we want to showcase? Sometimes it might be in a kind of diluted way because it's, you know, we're not like using in a, you know, a 10,000 gallon batch of something like, you know, you know, you can't get like dry farmed apples, like, you know, to that, to that scale. But we do think about it from a process point of view that how do you do it? So a couple of the things that we, you know, uh, in, the, in our cellar, we really try and focus on is acidity. Um, acidity levels, uh, just naturally, uh, you know, we, we, we are lucky uh, that we have acidity at all times available to us. Uh, like Field said, Alcohol levels above six, seven percent are harder. They start getting harder and harder to come by uh, without chaptalizing. Um, and aromatics in some of these more, um, you know, eating apples um, are are uh, like flamboyant. Um, and so we think about acidity, uh, density on the mid palate, um, and aromatics as being hallmarks of of our kind of northeast. Um, sense of place, and then and then having some diversity, uh, you know, dry on the drier side. Um, you know, mo- most if not all of our ciders are less than two percent RS, because it's uh, dryness, uh, you know, and and high acidity is just something. Uh, it's like every cider I've had from people, you know, gr- when I was kind of coming up and trying everything that was made locally had these characteristics to it. It was never like, hey, here, try this really sweet cider or something like that. Our, these farm ciders, these barrel ciders are high acid, low ABV, <laughs> um, dense, and aromatic. Um, and that's kind of what, what we focus on. And there's some people who think terroir is just a marketing gimmick. And, and I can be used as a marketing sort of uh, little seductive dance, but I think there's something very real about it too. But the neat thing about apple growing is so this Ren de Palm, which was the last one, is very low acid, um, high pH, low acid, whatever you want to call it. And it's a French apple. It's called, it's, it's called the Ren de Palm means the queen of the apples. And uh, it was a very obscure, well, it was, no, it was a, a grand French apple like in the 1500s in France, like during Louis the Fourteenth or something. And my parents found, found about, out about it in like a French apple book and it was stuck at a corner of the Geneva Apple Orchard, which is the USDA germplasm repository, which is the largest collection of apple species in the, um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And so my father knew a guy there. We, our orchard was grafted from weird varieties of apples. So, they were, so we saw the Ren de Palm and planted it. And, and so that's a classic, very French apple which is, you know, high tannins, low acid, a lot of that ripeness and that sort of, to me, is sort of autumnal, more earthy character. But what the interesting thing to this whole discussion and idea of terroir is here we are taking a French apple. Like, so the terroir of the Ren de Palme was France, but then we're growing it in New England. But that's kind of cool. Like, so, so terroir can kind of be a playful dance as well as like a strict orthodoxy. Like that's, you yeah. have this cool, cool chance to grow an apple from like that's out of its its French. You know, it's kind of like the story of American immigration or something, and then see what happens. And then here, I'm sure that Ren de Palm's grown here. It's now rarer in France. It was bigger like in the 1600s and 1500s, and so it's probably more well known in American apple growing circles now. 
but you can kind of just see, like, here's this grown here. I think that's a critical part of terroir, too, is when you're talking about um, the type of fruit you're growing. I mean, you, I think a lot of us all went into it to begin with who are growers and said, oh, yeah, I want to grow Yarlington Mill and Dabinette and all these, like, fancy, you know, uh, classic, you know, European cider varieties. And then all of a sudden, I know to begin with, for us, it's like we started growing some of this stuff, and I'm like, okay, a soap of Spitzenberg, you know, it doesn't grow for us, even on different rootstocks. Uh, in Yarlington Mill, mm, Kingston Black for us, mm, out of there. And so I think that part, a big piece of the terroir, of our terroir, is, the, is picking the varieties that grow well in our orchard and then running with those and not just going like, yeah, I'm going to grow, grow. They can make great Gravenstein cider in California. I'm going to grow them in Massachusetts. Uh, zone, you know, growing zone's a little bit different. So, uh, it, you know, picking varieties, the varieties you choose to grow and grow well for you and get the characteristics you want are a, a, a gigantic piece of terroir. Not, not just try getting, growing lousy, you know, what a Dabinets just because, you know, you really want Dabinets in your cider. Mm-hmm. I like Dabinets. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Me too. And you have some in your, your orchard. Yeah. yeah. We really like Roxbury russets, too, all of us. Like, mm-hmm. And uh, our farm is within 60 miles of Roxbury, so it hasn't traveled very far. Well, yeah. for us at this point, just, I mean, real quick, I know we're going to wrap up, but for us, us the, our biggest thing in the last, like, 10, 12 years now has been, um, uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of a cool thing, but, like, 12 years ago, we were just, like, looking around and starting to uh, explore for, like, new apple varieties, and almost all the new plantings that we've been doing in our orchard um, in the last five, six years now have been things that actually I've discovered locally, either from abandoned orchards or from just outright kind of wild settings, old abandoned. I have this one location that's like 3A. It was an old, an old orchard that goes back to the late 1700s, and the whole hillside is now basically just this like three and a half acre wild apple forest with hundreds, if not even thousand or more, just wild seedlings. Um, and I just go in there and watch stuff and see what fruits and start bringing that back. And so that's kind of kind of further developing the terroir. And I actually have a lot of that stuff kind of planted in at this point. So um, it's getting kind of exciting. And, you know, we're seeing this all across the U.S. I mean, it just so happens in New England, you know, we had the Maloney's kind of kicking, kick-starting the engine there for all of us. But, of course, we're seeing this also throughout, you know, in California, the discovery of the little wild, you know, feral apples or in the Finger Lakes region throughout the landscape. And so this is the first terroir spotlight of, of uh, CiderCon. I know there's going to be many more to come, which is super exciting. And the fact that we could even be in this place right now for cider, both in the U.S. and worldwide, is absolutely amazing. Also, a big part of the reason why we were here today with you is because we are celebrating our massive anniversary that we did for Franklin County Cider Days, which was 25 years. We just celebrated in 2019, which is pretty amazing. Um, Come to Cider Days. (laughs) Come to Cider Days. (laughs) Yeah, and bring your barrels and we'll fill them up. Um, so we're, if there's any questions, we could open up to a couple of questions. Yes. I was actually curious, with the, uh, with the cider making since 1984, have you seen much shift in climate and impact on the output of your the quality or characteristics or into our materials? So I'm just going to repeat the question. So a shift in climate uh, since 1984. Things are definitely getting weirder. I would say, I'd say to me, it's, it hasn't been... And I don't know if it's, it's so much because we're more conscious of it, but it definitely feels like it wasn't like over the last 20 years it was a gradual. It's more like it was like slow. Somehow the last five, ten years, would you, it just seemed way weirder. The, so it makes it much harder, more weird frost, more heat sp- the, the highs and lows. I mean, the for highs us, the and last lows. 16 yeah, years of growing, it's just like the highs and lows are just, you know, that's that's the big difference. Is so kind of you, almost the, the average is maybe going up, but it's the extremes like they talk about that are harder. Mm-hmm. Fire blight. Mm-hmm. And yeah, warm, wet weather when it's when the trees are blooming. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? We'll yeah. hang out for yes. a bit too. So. Uh, can you say anything about how you made the, your which, cider field? Which, which one? The 
last one? Well, the last last two were both both both. Um, I mean, I, I I'm definitely more on the white wine as a model of yes. cider fermentation. So, like, we're not we're not in the low. Like, I don't I like my I like the yeast to be happy. I, I we, we we're always trying. We're not trying to to starve. Um, you know, I, I've never been a big fan of low and slow, even though I've tasted some. Uh, and, and I don't know if that's too technical, but low, low, low temperature, slow fermentation. Um, I want the yeast to be happy. I want the fermentation to gallop along. I don't want it to get too fast. Um, and I'm delighted when the purity of the fruit is somehow expressed, but then that there's also interesting characteristics that have evolved through the fermentation. And there, you know, in, in, in uh, white wine yeast. Uh, stainless steel. Mm -hmm. uh, about three weeks. Mm -hmm. No back sweetening. We, 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 I'm having trouble with the connection. <laughs> uh, Siri. It's my wallet coming to me back to me. It's going to come back. Uh, we, 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 we've, we've, we've occasionally back sweetened over the years, but we basically try, because to me, back sweetening makes ciders too juicy. And if you can, so what we try to do is arrest the fermentation with some residual sugar through adding sulfite and uh, f filtration and so that you know, and sometimes we have some ciders that are just totally dry, like that will go to zero fermentation. But sometimes I find that, like to me, the model sometimes can be more like a Riesling, where that the acid, especially because like in New England, we're dealing with big acids. So that if you have that, and I've noticed that the fruity characteristics often of cider seem to me between three bricks to zero, like you lose a lot of that. And, and, and yet, at, at, at like three, two, three bricks, you're still getting a lot of, um, without it, with it being basically dry, I mean, dry in the, in the spectrum of, you know, commercial cider. Um, partly, I mean, an interesting experiment on that thing is if, think about, if you have, three bricks is very different if you have a big acid. Like three bricks with a big acid tastes fairly balanced and, and reasonably dry, it's good with food. If it's low acid, and it's three bakes, it's gonna taste really sweet. But, so, mm -hmm. so that would be. We'll, we'll just take one last question, then we're gonna, your hands raised, yeah, right there. Yeah? Uh, what's, what's the history of the New England style, and what do you think about non-New England cideries making a New England style? History of New um, England style and. Yeah, so the yeah. history of New England, New England style actually goes back to, um, you know, molasses becoming really cheap you know, uh, it's basically a commodity. And, you know, there's a lot of, obviously, a big ugly piece to that with kind of the Caribbean, you know, sugar cane trade and everything else. But in New England, uh, molasses became a very uh, uh, inexpensive sweetener, um, way, more, way less expensive than anything else. And so it got to a point where literally farmers and other, other people could afford to just buy it in quantity, which is why we think about colonial, like New England, when you hear stories about it, it's, what is it, it's rum and it's cider. And then the cider, well, you know, all of a sudden you could capitalize, bump up the alcohol of even your basic cider pretty inexpensively. So, I mean, that'd be roughly the history of it. And then New England farmers uh, just kept making it, and then right through Prohibition, just kept making, kept making it right along until, you know, there are still people doing it, and we're, you know, carry that tradition on. What was, is that... What Second was question was, what do we think about oh. non-New Englanders making New England style? I, I, I'm not, in, I don't think it's proprietary. I think, g give it a shot. I mean, for, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I think, yeah, I mean, for me, it's yeah, like, for can, it. should you grow a Riesling in California? It. You know, it's like, go for it. Yeah, but if you don't know, if you never had, I mean, the thing is, there's not like, you can go taste a Riesling and, you know, go to Europe and taste a Riesling and then, you know what it tastes like. There's not a one a, a standard for what a New England style was, and you'd find people using different basic base materials. Whether it's Dewey's, which, which we mentioned earlier, what use white sugar. You know, the people around me were using brown sugar. Other people, you know, traditionally probably would have been just straight up cheap 
blackstrap molasses, which you know would have been a very di much harsher even the stuff that I kind of brought along. So, and by region, that would definitely change. It, oh, absolutely, and whatever apples you were putting in and everything, it's again, it's, it's part of that terroir, and it was hyper-regional, you know, the stuff, I mean, the soil from where we are is way different from where Steve, you know, the other Steve is, so anyway. I, I just had a thought, maybe all these ciders out there adding fruit and all these other things are just kind of like a variation of a New England cider. Yeah. <laughs> now, hop yeah. ciders go back to the 1600s at least in England That's that right. I've read, so... Who knew? You know, it's and even in New, even in New England. That's right. References yeah. to hop ciders. <laughs> well, hey, cheers, everybody. We're gonna say goodbye and thank you for coming. All right. You could find links to all four cideries. That is Ragged Hill Artifact Cider Project, Bear Swamp Cider, and West County Cider at. The show notes for this year, episode 225. In the meanwhile, I'm going to roll out of here and wish you the best of day. And you know, you definitely know, I am looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. There is a reason There is a reason why we do it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason why we do it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason why we drink it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason We like walking through the orchards Dancing in the streets Smelling all the blossoms Kicking up our feet We like cider We we like palms. We like orchards. Having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh yeah. We, we like cider. Oh yes, we do. We like palm. Oh yes, we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Ba -da -da -dum. There is a reason why we do it like this. Ba -da -da -dum. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Ba -da -da -dum. Ba -da -da -dum. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. Ba -da -da -dum. We we like palms. Oh yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!